I am pleased to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Ann Yonatani. She's a microbiologist turned food entrepreneur uh, and natto maker. Uh, I first met Ann around in 2016 while I was profiling a ramen chef in Queens. And I remember being a little bit bemused by the fact that she was making small batch natto in New York. Um, for one thing, there didn't seem to be a market for it. And I also didn't see how it could compare to the stuff you can buy in the Japanese grocery store. Uh, but Anne reassured me that her natto was actually better than the stuff in the grocery store and that there was, in fact, a market for it. And I'm very pleased to be able to say that Anne was very right and I was very wrong. Uh, Anne worked for over 15 years as a biomedical research scientist in labs at Harvard Medical School and Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And she was also a professor of food studies at the New York, uh, the New School University. Two years ago, she combined her interest in food and science by starting, Nato, by starting the Natto company, Nurture Food. Her goal is to use her scientific background to educate and help people to make healthier, sustainable choices about food, and she hopes to help make Natto popular in the US. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Yonatani to the stage. Well, thank you, Sho and Tomomi. And, and to the Japan Society for having me come speak tonight. And to all of you here in the audience, it's really quite wonderful to see so many people gathered here in New York to hear about Natto. And I'm sure amongst you are Natto aficionados, as well as Natto novices, and perhaps even a few just still Natto curious. <laughs> um, so today I'll start very simply by uh, beginning with just telling you what natto is, how it is made, and, and how it came to be. And then I'd like to spend the bulk of the time actually talking to you, introducing you to the many amazing, um, amazing health properties, healthful properties of this ancient Japanese food and the health benefits that are associated with them, and some of the science behind all of that. And once I've convinced you all to start incorporating natto into your diets, or more of it, um, <clears throat> then I want to show you how versatile natto can be as a, as a culinary ingredient and um, how it can be enjoyed in, in many, both traditional as well as non-traditional ways. And some of them you'll be able to, um, you'll have the opportunity to taste at the reception following the talk. So, first, if I may, uh, take a moment to just, um, explain how or, or really why I became such a cheerleader for natto uh, in America. Um, it was certainly an unexpected career path uh, for me, and I think it's safe to say that, uh, that it was for uh, my father, who's here somewhere in the audience, I think. Um, I think he's still scratching his head a little bit. <laughs> Um, but I am a Japanese-American. I was raised uh, in Philadelphia, mostly. Uh, but both of my parents are from Japan. Um, but when I was growing up, uh, at least where I lived, it was pretty much impossible to find natto. I mean, it's still rather difficult in many places, but not nearly as hard as it used to be. So I was introduced to natto in Japan when I would go to visit relatives um, over there during summer vacations. Um, <clears throat> and that, you know, happened very naturally because natto really is um, such an integral part of the common everyday, you know, household food experience for most Japanese families. Um, <clears throat> Many people ask me if I remember the, the first time, the first taste of natto. And I can't say that I do. I think I was probably too young. Um, but I can't say, I can't also say that it was an entirely positive experience. But I do know that I came to, to love natto. 
um, as I grew older, and, um, and that it became part of my food landscape from a very early age. But then I grew up to become a microbiologist with a great personal weakness for fermented foods. Um, and as a biologist, I'm fascinated by the ecology of, of microorganisms that live within, inside each and every one of us, um, our gut flora. And this gut flora is now understood to have an impact on so many aspects of, of our health, of our overall well-being. So I'm also interested in how eating fermented foods that are made with probiotic species of bacteria affects these relationships and, and in turn, our health. So natto is one such food. It is a fermented and probiotic food that also happens to have a number of other healthful properties, making it really quite unique, uh, a uniquely powerful superfood. So that's the, the title of today's talk. And I think America is now finally ready for it, too. So what is natto? Oops, sorry. What is natto? Well, natto is composed simply of whole, unadulterated soybeans, which are steamed and then uh, fermented by the beneficial bacterial species Bacillus subtilis natto. And the product of this fermentation is something that's so different from the original soybeans. It's really quite uh, amazing. It's known for its very distinctive, funky flavor and aroma, and perhaps more so for its, um, its very special gooey texture. So you can see in the background here some of this um, special sauce coming off of the beans. Um, <coughs> Uh, as, as the film is being pil pulled back. Um, and in Japanese, this, this sticky stuff is known as neba neba. And this is probably the quality about natto, not its taste or its smell. It's the neba neba that's the most polarizing quality about natto, the thing that people either love or hate about natto, I think. Um, but either way, Natto is a, a deeply um, traditional, ancient Japanese food. A friend of mine once described it as Japanese soul food, and I completely agree. That's, that's what it is. Um, and it remains a very popular food in Japan, um, primarily as a, a breakfast staple. But what does it taste like? <laughs> I get this question all the time. Um, and usually I have to answer first that no, it tastes nothing like kimchi. But then, um, how's this for a description? Like, sort of like Boston baked beans crossed with a deliciously stinky washed rind French cheese with the slippery, um, gooey mouthfeel of southern stewed okra. Maybe, maybe with a little bit of the alkalinity of pretzel thrown in there and, and some coffee. <laughs> Show and I were just discussing how to describe it. So does anyone agree with these flavor notes? It, and I'm also very open to hearing more suggestions because, again, this is a topic that comes up all the time for me. So any kind of international mashup um, of other food flavor notes is, is very welcome. Uh, okay. So, as is true for most traditional foods, there are many legends surrounding its, its origins. And like most fermented foods, it probably happened by accident. So, the most popular story about natto credits the great samurai and scholar, Lord Minamoto Yoshie, with creating the circumstances for Natto's discovery over a thousand years ago. And so the story goes that um, 
during battles over territory, territories in northern Japan, the shogun and his warriors one night were settling down to a, a simple meal of rice and cooked soybeans. Uh, when they got word that, uh, that an enemy army was approaching. So they decided that it was best to, uh, to flee or retreat. So they quickly wrapped up their food in available uh, rice straw that they found in the fields and, um, and escaped on horseback. And so this straw provided a natural source of Bacillus subtilis bacteria which then fermented the beans as they were in the warmth and the heat and the moisture of the sweat on a running horse's back through the night. And then apparently the next day they, they were now in a safe place and they opened the parcels of soybeans and found them to be fermented into natto and, and found them to be quite delicious. So. That's the story of, of natto's origins. And, and natto did quickly spread around that time from 1,000 years ago to other parts of Japan as a, as a dish, particularly in the northern and eastern parts of Japan, where it remains most popular. Uh, in the picture on the right here, you see um, natto soybeans being packaged into uh, rice straw bundles called wara. Um, so this is sort of an homage to the, the historical legend of how natto was, was created first. But this actually was the way that natto continued to be made for a number of centuries by using the natural bacteria from, from straw. But now natto is no longer fermented this way. Um, mostly for food safety reasons. But there do exist a few, a few natto makers, um, mostly in Mito City, which is kind of the epicenter of natto culture in Japan. Um, a few makers who, who still do package their, uh, their already fermented natto in wara. So the natto is fermented in a, in a different sort of vessel and then at the end, package into waro just for sale. Some other small producers use other types of natural materials for their packaging, like on the upper right. Um, this maker uses uh, kyogi, which is a, a pine bark paper, which is then folded into an origami style into a beautiful little triangle triangular package with the natto inside. But the vast majority of natto that's sold, made and sold today in Japan um, is packaged pretty uniformly in these uh, sort of styrofoam clamshell boxes with a little piece of plastic film on top of the beans, which, uh, which I think is rather sad <laughs> because it's such an unattractive package and so environmentally unfriendly. Um, but this is the standard way that, that natto is packaged by most of the larger natto companies. To my knowledge, our natto, uh, made here in New York City, is the only natto in the world that's packaged in glass jars. Um, but natto culture is alive and well in Japan where Hundreds of metric tons of natto are eaten each year. If you walk into any supermarket in Japan, you're likely to see dozens of brands of natto, kind of in the manner that you might see many different brands of yogurt or cereal in this country. Natto is that popular, that ubiquitous a food for the Japanese. Um, Although the industry has consolidated quite a bit in recent decades, there still exists over 200 uh, individual natto companies, natto producers in Japan, a country the size of the state of California. Uh, the majority of those companies are quite small, you know, small batch artisanal producers who primarily um, sell their product in a pretty local area. 
um, most of the natto um, that comes over here is not from those sorts of companies, but only from the very largest sort of industrial sized companies that can afford to export their product overseas. So this year I, I traveled to Japan um, in part to attend the natto competition uh, in March. This is an annual event where natto makers, mostly small natto makers from all over the country, gather um, to, to compete, to have their nattos judged by a panel of experts, which um, some of whom you can see here in their white lab coats and, and their uh, clipboards. Um, all the nattos are laid out quite anonymously on these long tables and then assessed for taste, for smell, texture, and uh, appearance. And uh, <clears throat> it's really quite, quite an amazing thing to see that natto, I mean, the natto is judged with such seriousness and attention to the subtleties of, of these aesthetic qualities um, with, you know, all of the, uh, all of the attention to detail of a, of a wine competition, really. Um, this year there were over 200 different varieties of natto competing um, for prizes in various categories. So, um, and the award ceremony was complete with uh, natto dress-up characters <laughs> in, in true Japanese form. So for any Hardcore Natto fans, I highly recommend trying to catch this event because it is really special. It's just such a wacky thing to see. Um, and it takes place every year in the spring. Okay, so next, how is Natto made? Well, I first learned how to make Natto in Japan uh, from a fifth generation natto maker there in Tokyo. And he told me that the most important thing in, in making a really good natto was to start from really good soybeans. <clears throat> and many people don't know that natto, or at least good natto, cannot be made from just any soybean but rather natto is made from very special varieties or cultivars of soybean that are specifically bred for the purpose of making natto. So they're not soybeans that are used for making tofu or soy sauce or any other soy food product. They are specific for being ideal for the purpose of being fermented into natto. And they have many sort of biological characteristics that make them ideal. Um, <clears throat> so as such, um, these beans are also GMO free. <clears throat> Another surprise um, to most people in, in Japan actually is that uh, the vast majority of natto that is made, and obviously that's in Japan, is actually made from soybeans that are grown in the United States. Which makes perfect sense. If, the, if Japan is consuming hundreds of metric tons of natto product each year, there simply isn't anywhere near enough land in Japan to grow that amount of soybeans. So something like 80% of the natto that's produced in the world is made from US grown soy. So we've been lucky enough to, you know, make connections with those very farmers that for years have been exporting all of their natto soybeans to Japan <laughs> um, to, to make our natto domestically. So really it's fermentation that transforms soybeans into natto. Um, and fermented foods, just to define it, are, are those foods that are made with the help of friendly microorganisms. And these can be bacteria or yeasts or other forms of microbes, in this case bacteria. 
And fermented foods are found in, in every culture across the world, um, every cuisine, because fermentation was really an ancient way to help preserve foods, to protect them from being contaminated by potentially dangerous microbes. So this is the way that people kept food edible for longer in the days before refrigeration existed. So natto uh, is made pretty simply, really. Um, natto beans are first uh, cooked, usually by steaming, or they can also be boiled. Um, then they're seeded with uh, purified culture these days, not with um, rice straw, but purified cultures of Bacillus subtilis. And then that mixture is allowed to incubate in a warm and moist environment for just one day. And the next day, that, those soybeans are already transformed into, into natto. Um, to really develop the full flavor and texture of a good natto, usually there's a, a sort of aging period after that, kind of analogous to the way cheeses often have to age to reach their full potential. So that's also true for natto. Um, so it really is quite magical how fermentation can really completely alter the, the flavor and the texture of, of the soybeans. But another thing that fermentation does is make, uh, make, in this case, soybeans, but all foods that are fermented more digestible. Because what fermentation really is is those benign microbes that you've added to the food. Fermentation is really just those microbes like starting to chow down on that food. They're starting to eat it and break it down into its basic nutrients, making them more available to you when you eat that food. And in some cases, even creating new nutrients through fermentation. And that's the case for natto. Um, and we'll get to that uh, very shortly. So if there's any food that I think deserves the title superfood, and in general, I'm really not a fan of that word because it's really overused. <laughs> but if there is any one food that deserves a title, I think that it's natto. And at a time when most of us are looking for more healthy, more plant-based, and less processed food options, you know, natto really fits the bill on all counts. As you can see from this, you know, basic nutritional panel, this is actually the label from our own natto, um, in its basic form, uh, natto is a two-ingredient food made from two whole ingredients, just soy GMO-free soybeans and beneficial bacteria. Two ingredients, like how many foods do you buy in the store that have two ingredients? Not very many. <laughs> um, <coughs> of course, if you're buying a sort of industrial natto that comes with uh, you know, the little packets of tare sauce and mustard, then that ingredient list can expand quite a bit um, with preservatives and added sugars and salts and um, all sorts of other ingredients. But the basic natto, does, or it should, the basic natto should contain only two ingredients and nothing more. And as such, it is vegan and gluten-free. Um, it is also probiotic because of the beneficial bacteria that ferment it. And that fermentation produces at least two very important uh, new uh, nutrients or healthful compounds, and those are vitamin K2 and natto kinase enzyme. And on top of all that, if you look at the nutritional chart, you know, natto just simply has a terrific nutritional profile. It's an incredible source of plant-based protein. It's also a great source of fiber, vit many vitamins, um, a number of essential minerals, potassium, iron, magnesium, and calcium. So don't worry, I know that was a lot fast, 
I'm going to go over the main points again much more slowly. Um, there are really three main points that I want to focus on, and these are the three qualities of natto that really put natto in a class by itself, because these are quite unique to natto. So they are, very quickly, natto is probiotic. Um, and it may be useful just to define what probiotic means. So probiotic is any food or supplement product that contains living, living microorganisms in it. And those microorganisms must have been shown to have some kind of positive benefit for human health. Okay. So, and Bacillus subtilis is one such type of microorganism. It is indeed a member of the human microbiome. Um, <clears throat> but this is not the same as fermented. So many people confuse these two terms. Um, not all fermented foods are probiotic, okay? because many fermented foods don't meet either one of the two key criteria, either the microorganisms in that food that were once alive and used to make that food may be no longer living by the time you eat that food product. And second, those microorganisms may not have been shown or may not be known to have any significant benefit for human health. Okay. So, Probiotic is a very particular subset of fermented foods. Um, the second main point is vitamin K2. Um, vitamin K2 is a micronutrient that has emerging evidence shows that it's very important for both bone health and cardiovascular health. And natto has a lot of it. Finally, natto kinase is an enzyme that's also produced during the fermentation by Bacillus subtilis. And this is an enzyme that uh, naturally has a blood thinning activity and is thought to be preventative for stroke and, and cardiac disease. I'll go through each one of these um, in, in more detail now. So, Natto is probiotic, but why, why are probiotics good? You know, we hear this word all of the time, but sometimes people don't really know why are we chasing probiotic products. Well, the answer is because probiotics can replenish and diversify our gut microbiome. So our microbiome, microbiome is a, is a, collect, a term for the, a collective term for the thousands of species of beneficial microorganisms that, that live mostly inside us, but also upon us. Um, they live symbiotically with us, and in fact, we can't live without them. It's becoming clear. Um, so there are microorganisms everywhere within our bodies and on all surfaces of our bodies, everywhere that comes in contact with the environment around us is frankly teeming with microorganisms. And this is a good thing. <laughs> we have to get used to that, that concept, actually. Um, you may have heard this factoid before that the human body contains many more bacterial cells than it does our own human cells by possibly as much as a factor of 10. So the bacteria in and on our bodies actually outnumber us, um, although they're very small, so they don't take up very much room, so it's easy not to notice them. But they're there, and again, it's very possible that we can't live without them. And again, Bacillus subtilis is one of these species that seems to be a normal resident of a healthy human gut. So the majority of these microorganisms do live inside of us in the, um, in the gut. And what's becoming clearer, well, what's not clear yet is exactly what each one of these different species of microorganisms is doing. 
um, on an individual level. Um, but it is becoming clear that as a, as a community, um, they have such a profound impact on, on all parts of the body, on all sorts of organ systems. Um, not just digestion and metabolism, which is what people originally thought, because most of them were located in the gut. But it's very clear now that they also have connections to mental health, to cardiovascular health, bone health, um, immune health and even reproductive health. And this is not even an exhaustive list of all of the areas in which the microbiome seems to have some significant connection. Um, and really, this the study of the microbiome and its impact on human health is one of the most exciting areas in, in biology and medicine right now. I mean, it's a field that's just exploding with new knowledge um, year after year right now. Um, and understanding how, not only what organisms are there, what they're doing, and how they, you know, how, they, how we coexist with them, um, but also how including them and the nutrients that they need to survive in our diets May, may really be a critical part of, um, of health and well-being for us. So natto is chock full of probiotics, um, chock full of bacillus subtilis in particular. And over the last couple of years, we've actually been collaborating with scientists at, at Harvard and now at Tufts to look a little bit into the biology inside our natto. And we found some interesting things. First, we found that indeed um, our natto contains billions, uh, even tens of billions, of viable probiotic cells per three tablespoon serving of natto. And that our natto contains a mixture of both um, sort of normal live bacterial cells and spores. So let me get to what that is. What does that mean? Um, so an interesting feature of this particular species of bacteria, Bacillus subtilis, is that it is a, a spore-forming species. Um, so as part of its natural life cycle, it's capable of going into a sort of dormant state and forming a spore which is more or less analogous to um, the seed of a plant. So most bacteria cannot do this, but Bacillus subtilis can. And what's great about spores, like seeds, is that they're highly resistant to all sorts of very harsh environmental conditions. In fact, that's why and how they arise when Bacillus subtilis encounters unfavorable environmental conditions, it can decide to go into dormant mode and form spores. And these spores can wait around almost indefinitely until conditions improve, upon which they can magically wake up and start, you know, reviving into normal living cells and grow and divide. So spores are extremely resistant to, um, to uh, variations in temperature, in pH changes, chemi chemicals, radiation. And on top of that, re they require no food, no water, no light, no oxygen. OK, so why do we care? This is really important for, for two reasons that pertain to probiotics. So, one important criticism of probiotic foods and probiotic uh, products, supplements, is that really the vast majority of live bacteria that one ingests are pretty much immediately killed um, by the, the very harsh uh, acidic environment of the stomach. Right? And this is generally a good thing. Um, you know, we're designed that way to protect us from infection and sickness. So this is a, a very useful mechanism most of the time. 
But it, it does mean that when we're consuming probiotics, only a very tiny, tiny percentage of those live micro, microbial species um, that are found in probiotic foods are likely to survive and actually make it to your gut where you want them to go. But spores, on the other hand, at least in theory, should be resistant to stomach acid and as they are to many other, you know, incredibly harsh conditions. So we believe that natto may be a particularly effective probiotic vehicle that can actually deliver these helpful microbes to the gut with much greater efficiency than other fermented foods that are made with less hardy species of, of microorganisms. The second point is that um, freezing and thawing is also a pretty good way to kill many live bacteria. Um, cells in general, both bacterial and animal cells, really don't hold up very well to freezing and thawing because cells are made primarily of water. And so the expansion and contraction of water during that freezing and thawing process really tends to shatter and damage cells, usually beyond repair. So, um, you know, that's why cryogenics is still a thing of science fiction. It doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> So both of these things do have important implications for probiotic foods or supplements which, which are frozen, which, by the way, all natto that comes from Japan is frozen during export. So if you're eating imported natto, that natto has definitely been frozen and, and thawed at least once before it's gotten to you, probably more than once. So... That freezing and thawing is likely to have killed the majority of live cells in, in a frozen natto. But luckily for natto <laughs> and natto eaters, there probably is also spores in there. And spores, at least in theory, um, may have remained relatively unharmed. So they may still have some probiotic power, but, um, but still, fresh natto that has never been frozen will definitely contain a much higher number of live microbes. Vitamin K2, um, ooh, I need to speed along here. Um, vitamin K2 is a micronutrient that you're definitely going to be hearing more and more about because it's becoming clear that it's very essential for both bone and cardiovascular health. And natto is by far, by far, the best possible food source for this particular vitamin. So what vitamin K2 does, very simply, is it functions in calcium transport. It, it is necessary for bringing calcium out of your bloodstream, where you don't want it, to your bones, where you do want it, very simply. Um, so clinical studies in Japan show an amazing amount of geographical correlation, population, epidemiological correlation between natto consumption and bone density in individuals, as well as lower rates of bone fractures of several kinds, particularly in older women. And many cardiologists in this country are really jumping on the, the K2 bandwagon these days, um, you know, recommending uh, vitamin K2 supplements because too much calcium in the bloodstream can actually lead to cardiovascular disease um, or arterial calcification. Um, in the absence of enough vitamin K2 in your bloodstream and in your diet, calcium does just that. It accumulates and forms solids or deposits within the blood vessels. So after decades of, um, of encouraging people to eat more calcium, to take calcium supplements, this advice may actually have led to quite a bit of increase in cardiovascular disease because most Americans do not have 
enough vitamin K2 in their diets. But a serving of natto contains even more um, vitamin K2 than most common K2 supplements, um, far more than any other food, and almost all of it in its most bioactive form, MK7, which, is, which I'm happy to talk about later, perhaps at the reception if anyone's interested. But just quickly, this, this bar graph really drives it home. These are like... Uh, uh, shows the uh, level of vitamin K2 per 100 gram serving of many of the um, most concentrated most concentrated food sources of K2, and you know natto just blows the rest of the field away, obviously. And another point is that all of the other foods listed here are um, either dairy or meat products. So for people who are uh, eating a plant-based diet or even a vegan diet, natto is actually the only good food source for vitamin K that exists. And finally, natto kinase. Um, I'll be really quick here, I promise. <laughs> <coughs> finally, uh, the third product of natto fermentation that's of note is natto kinase, or natto kinase, as it's often pronounced in Japanese. And this is a fibrinolytic enzyme, which is a fancy name for an enzyme that's good at breaking down certain kinds of um, protein aggregates in the body. It's called natto kinase because it was originally identified and purified from natto. In practical terms, natto kinase is a natural blood thinner. It has been shown to be able to break down and prevent blood clotting, uh, both in lab experiments in, in vitro, as well as in animal and human studies in vivo. So thus, many people already take natto kinase in purified pill form as a, uh, as a supplement, shown here on sale at Whole Foods. Actually, two different brands of natto kinase on sale at Whole Foods. Um, it's considered to be a more natural or milder alternative to pharmaceutical blood thinners like warfarin being the most popular as a preventative against stroke and cardiac events. But if you're going to go natural, why, why not take in nat natto kinase from its original source, from natto, and enjoy it at the same time, get all these other benefits also, um, and it's cheaper as well. So many reasons. So many reasons, but with so many compelling reasons, why aren't more people eating natto? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's my mission to change that. But, um, but there are many reasons. And it turns out that uh, even in Japan, um, it's, it has been a problem in recent decades. There, there was actually a decline in natto consumption and many other traditional foods, too. So that's probably, um, you know, because of uh, younger generations acquiring more of a taste for Western foods, which they're not accustomed to mixing with natto. But I will show you, and you will taste how that's, that's also not true. Um, so the natto industry has responded by um, trying to appeal to the new generation with new kinds of natto, black natto, green natto, multicolored natto, and dried natto. Um, and it works. Uh, dried natto is so popular that, you know, they actually serve it on Japan Airlines in little packets instead of peanuts. Yeah. Um, but, and natto consumption is back on, on a slow rise in, in Japan, and certainly in, in the rest of the world, too. Um, but I think the key to encouraging more people to eat natto, particularly those outside of Japan, um, is to reimagine how it can be eaten in new ways that fit better with the lifestyle of other cultures. So traditionally, natto is eaten simply with a bowl of white rice, perhaps some scallions and soy sauce, maybe a raw egg yolk uh, for breakfast. But, you know, for the average American, and this is a delicious and very authentic way to eat it. I eat it like that uh, very often. Um, it's great. 
But for many people, you know, um, who don't have a rice cooker that's constantly on and full of rice, you know, I don't even remember how to cook rice, right? Um, and for breakfast, right, that doesn't really make sense. And for those that are new to natto, maybe a little apprehensive, like breakfast is probably not the best time to dig in with a raw egg yolk on top of it. So, you know, there are many, many other ways to enjoy natto. Um, and just a few of them are shown here. Um, I like to throw it on pretty much anything. <laughs> um, and these are just some examples of, of ways that, that I've really enjoyed it. You know, instead of rice, putting it with pasta or bread or, or grits or polenta is one thing that you'll try tonight. Or throwing it in, um, in a salad or in a soup. Um, there are really endless possibilities. I mean, my, my basic instruction to people that are trying it for the first time is to think of it like a cheese and throw it on anything you might put cheese on, okay, as a general rule of thumb. Um, so I think I should wrap up here um, so that we have time for the discussion. But um, I'll just put up... The, the menu that we've prepared for you tonight to sample our different nattos. Um, so we have three different nattos, the original natto, uh, black natto, and a turmeric natto, which are all um, being prepared as we speak, I believe. So I want to thank those who are, who are doing so right now. Um, Jesse Hulsley um, of Elevate Food Design and May Goldsmith are busy in the kitchen um, plating these hors d'oeuvres for you. And I also wanted to extend a special thanks to um, Miki Kash Kashiwagi-san, um, without whom this event would not have taken place. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of you as well. So we have just a little bit of time for questions. Um, I guess my first question is I don't think you quite explain what the stringy stuff is. Ah, yes, the neba neba. Um, so in technical terms, um, the neba neba is actually a, what's called a biofilm. So many microbes produce, some, produce a biofilm. This is sort of a protective substance that they secrete to create an environment for themselves. It's through which they can move and talk to each other um, and protect themselves. Uh, so yeah, this is a, a very common biological phenomenon. You see it in nature all the time. You just don't often see it in your food. But, uh, but Bacillus subtilis happens to be a really prolific biofilm maker. So that's why, um, that's why this food is, is so full of it. And all of those healthy molecules I just talked at length about, those are all in the, in the biofilm, in the special sauce. So is there any truth to the, the old wives' tales of the, the more neba neba there is, the, the better it is for you? The oh, tastier it is? Right, uh, like the mixing. Yeah. So in Japan, um, typically when stirs up the natto before, before eating it, before putting it on the rice to really um, increase the volume of, of, the, of the neba neba because it, it froths up quite well. Um, I don't actually think there's any reason to think that that alters its um, health properties. Uh, if anything, like I would think stirring it might actually decrease any natto kinase <laughs> activity <laughs> that was in it, because enzymes generally don't like to be agitated like that. But otherwise, I, I don't think it really has much actual effect. I think it's more of a, a mouthfeel um, flavor. It may perhaps change the flavor profile. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's just a, a taste thing, really. So for people, there are other varieties of natto. Correct. There are, yeah, yeah. Oh. I mean, like I have zipped through them really quickly, mm -hmm. but you know, like the different colors, the 
black and the green nattos are becoming more popular. Um, there's also hikiwari natto, which is chopped up natto, which is easier to eat. It tends to be more popular with both younger and older people. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But you yourself, your company produces several varieties of natto, correct? We do, yeah. Um, they are the, the so normal natto. So we have the sort of traditional brown natto. We also make a black natto, which is delicious and uh, has a very different taste, actually. Um, you know, soybeans come in many different colors. A lot of people don't have never seen other colors, so they think they're all brown. But, you know, like apples come in red or green and lots of colors in between. Soybeans also come in a variety of colors. And they're not only different in color, but they have other different characteristics too, different flavors, um, just like other produce that, that comes in many different varieties. So the black natto is much milder, kind of chocolatey, chocolatey coffee tasting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you also produce uh, turmeric natto. Mm -hmm. right? So um, with that, is there a lot of innovation in the natto making industry now in that style? In, in sort of the flavor realm? I think they're starting to be in Japan. Mm -hmm. um, uh, not turmeric. Uh, I've certainly gotten a lot of shocked reactions from people. <laughs> from when I brought turmeric natto to the natto competition, I was able to you know, sample it with, with many natto makers over there who were all like uniformly, oh my god. <laughs> but, uh, but they liked it, actually. So, um, but there are flavorings, um, more Japanese-style flavorings, things like Ume and shiso, um, those are definitely flavors of natto that I've seen in Japan. Are those incorporated into the process of making the natto, or is that, or is it, is it turmeric no, also? No, it's it's um it's usually uh it's usually just added know, just after the fact. Added after the fact. Um, in most cases, just added as a flavoring in the little tare package, actually. Mm -hmm. So then I think, I think the natto itself is just the same natto. It's actually only the sauce hmm. that carries the flavor. I did want to ask about um, the freezing process that most of the natto that you would eat if you bought it at the Japanese grocery store. Mm -hmm. like that freezing process, it might, it'll kill off live bacteria. Does it also affect the taste? I think it does, yeah. I mean like freezing and thawing most foods, mm -hmm. if you're not you know, using high technology um, to do so. Yeah, it affects the, the texture and the flavor of foods, I think, usually in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Have mm -hmm. you ever frozen your own natto to test it? Uh, no. <laughs> no, I haven't. Let's well, try. Um, so if I, I should have, though. It occurs to me, like, why haven't I ever done that? <laughs> It'd be pretty, pretty easy. Um, so when, for people who have never tried natto, um, mm -hmm. first of all, what is, the, what is the main stumbling block for them in your experience? And second of all, what do you usually recommend they do when mm. they first try it? Yeah, well, I really think, um, I think it's the neba neba. You know, it's that gooey, sort of snotty texture that's very unfamiliar um, in Western cuisine. In, in Japan and I think other Asian cultures too, that kind of like gooey, um, mucilaginous texture is much more common and actually quite revered. I mean, that's why there's a word for it, because people like it. Um, there are many foods in Japan that have a similar kind of mouthfeel. Um, but here it's, it's really, um, I can't think of another food besides okra that has it, and okra is pretty polarizing. So, um, so yeah, I think it's that, that gooey texture. And what I tell people to do um, to overcome that uh, is one, try the black natto, because it's actually much less sticky, uh, but also to sort of try to mix it into foods that can kind of incorporate that gooiness and kind of hide it almost. Like. So if you mix it into like 
guacamole or hummus, like a, a dip kind of thing, um, that can really mostly get rid of that gooiness or at least dilute it quite a bit so that it's, it's really not as noticeable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I know that you've approached chefs before, like around the city and in mm -hmm. the metropolitan area, and some of them have been very interested. Um, what have they done to try to make it palatable to their customers? Let's see. Um, well, uh, one chef, uh, Peter Serpico, did something very interesting with it. Um, he made a natto butter. Mm. So he mixed natto into, you know, really good quality butter with some other condiments and ingredients, um, you know, to be simply eaten on bread or crackers. Hmm. So I guess we only have, yeah, this is probably the last question. Um, so I saw that you had made an ice cream out of natto. Yeah. And yeah. do you think that there's a limiting view of natto as a purely savory food. I do. I mean... Um, well, I mean, was the ice cream good? The ice cream was excellent. And again, uh, I feel like I keep plugging the black natto. But th this was made... I made an ice cream with so start black, with the black natto. natto and, sure. and I think it really has to be done with black because the black has a, a milder, um, more neutral flavor. Uh, as well as less of a sticky texture. And so, yeah, the black can really go either way, in my opinion. It can go either sweet or savory. Though, you know, in Japan, one never eats natto, you know, with sweet foods. But I think it can actually work. Um, the yogurt parfait tonight is, is actually black natto that's slightly sweetened with honey, um, served on a coconut milk-based yogurt. By the way, all of the all of the hors d'oeuvres are vegan. <clears throat> okay. Well, I actually have one last question, yeah. and that is: uh, Have you been surprised, or um, has it been basically what you'd expected as you've tried to popularize natto among the general population that is just basically unfamiliar with it and its textures and its taste? Have you been surprised by how easy it has been, or have you been uh, surprised how challenging it has been? Or has it gone as how well, you've expected? It's, you know, it's gone in every direction um, with individual people. But overall, I have to say that I am really very pleasantly surprised at how, how many people are really open to it. Um, you know, in part because I, I do like to trumpet its, its health benefits and, um, you know, of course, people, people all want that. <laughs> So, uh, so it helps to convince people to give it a try. But I think, you know, a surprising number of people, if they're willing to give it a try, they find that it's, um, yeah, that it, it can be really, some people love it the first time they try it, honestly. Um, and that, that, I think, was a surprise to me mm -hmm. to see. But, uh, yeah, it's it's actually a much more easy to like food than, than the reputation that precedes it. Well, I think that's all the time we have.